This is Agriculture Today. I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Ahead of us today on this Tuesday's programming, we have Justin Wagner, K-State Beef Cattle Specialist. He shares insight into ammoniating wheat straw and considerations for producers to keep in mind. Also ahead, K-State field crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth shares information on soybean pests for producers to look out for in the coming weeks ahead. We end with this week's milk line segment from K-State dairy specialist Mike Brook. He concludes with remarks on the upcoming corn silage harvest and what producers should be keeping in mind this time of year. That and more awaits us ahead on Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today. We are back now with Justin Wagner. He is our K-State beef cattle specialist and today he's going to be talking to us about ammoniating wheat straw and some considerations when it comes to doing that. So Justin, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Samantha. We're talking about ammoniating wheat straw because this is something that's commonly done when we're experiencing drought conditions such as what we're experiencing now. You know, that's correct. I think when we look at this, you know, the state right now, about 47 percent of the state is is experiencing some sort of drought conditions that, you know, vary from extreme all the way to a slight or moderate drought. But uh, one of the staples that cattle producers have often used to get them through uh, periods of drought has been utilizing crop residues like like wheat straw. And then one of the things we can do is we can treat uh, wheat straw with anhydrous ammonia and we can actually improve the, the digestibility of that wheat straw, which leads to higher intakes and, and basically, you know, essentially get a, a higher quality product out of that straw by applying that anhydrous ammonia. Because that's the appeal of this, right, is that we're considering this to be a product that's a residue. So it's going to be cheaper than it would be buying, you know, the good stuff. But then you're going to take something that's considered low quality and you're going to treat it to make it a higher quality. So that's really the appeal of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, oftentimes it's uh, not so much the economics, but just the availability of some of those other forages that are out there. And and in essence, you know, oftentimes we do have wheat straw that's available uh, when we don't have other what I'd call moderate to low quality forages that are available to us just because of drought. So we kind of talked about the why we, we would consider feeding ammoniating wheat straw, but let's talk about the how. How do we really do this? Yeah, so essentially what we do with that process is we stack that hay in typically round bales in a 3-2-1 arrangement or a 3-2 arrangement. We want to clear the site and do a little bit of site prep because the anhydrous will effectively kind of sterilize that site. And we also want to remove anything that would poke holes in plastic. And so we essentially come in, do some site prep, stack those bales. We'll utilize a six mil black plastic. We'll cover that stack and then seal the edges with soil and insert essentially an anhydrous line that's attached to, a, you know, just a common anhydrous tank. And then we'll turn that on and, and allow that uh, anhydrous to uh, basically accumulate in that stack. Then we'll then leave those bales covered for, depending on temperature during the warmer months of the year, like we are right now in August, Coming into the summer months, you know, we can leave those stacks covered for as little as two weeks. Seven to ten days is certainly adequate. As we get colder, it takes longer to see that application take effect. So that is something to be aware of. But that's kind of in brief that the how. Uh, there's a great YouTube video that's on the KSUBeef.org site that if you want to see kind of the, the how-to process of um, treating straw with anhydrous ammonia, that's a great resource to go look at. You recently wrote a Beef Tips article about it, specifically addressing some research that K-State has recently done on this subject exactly. And it's kind of the suggestion of, hey, you could get close to, you know, the value that you would hope out of this by using a smaller percentage of the ammonia treatment. Yeah, so typically when we treat uh, straw or any type of forage with anhydrous ammonia, what we use is a 3% application rate. Uh, So 60 pounds of anhydrous per dry ton of hay. And so a few years back here at K-State, I'd come across some literature that that showed fairly good responses to actually a half rate application. So applying one and a half percent. It was a a fairly small scale study. It was K-State work. 
Uh, and so we thought, well, let's just take this to full field scale. Let's let's see what kind of response we would get. And really what we found was that we could apply half the amount of anhydrous ammonia and get about 60% of the response that we would see with the traditional 3% rate. Now, when we did this research um, back in 2012, 2013, 2014 was was when we were working on this project, we were looking at anhydrous prices that were around $800 per ton. And, and we thought those were high, so it was fairly timely at that point. Well, fast forward a few more years, and we're in a much higher anhydrous ammonia uh, market uh, today than what we were then. And so I think this is an important consideration that we may be able to get uh, a very good response to a much lower rate of anhydrous application and save ourselves a, a few dollars in the process. Typically, reducing that rate reduces the cost of application by about 20 to $30 per ton, kind of depending on inputs. And, you know, we've got some fixed costs in there in terms of labor and stacking and those type of things. But typically it's it's around 20 to $30 per ton just by reducing that anhydrous ammonia application rate in, to one and a half versus that 3% traditional application rate. You've mentioned this in your article here that when producers are taking into account, you know, cost probably is one major thing, but availability is another. If there are other options out there for producers in terms of forage that they could be using as opposed to this, what are some of those options? Yeah, so oftentimes we compare uh, treated wheat straw back to what I'd call just moderate quality grass hay. And so, you know, right now, you know, our cost, If we even if we use that half application rate and we put a reasonable estimate on cost, we're well over $100 per ton in that straw if we had to go out and purchase it for $70 a ton. Now, obviously, you know, if you have your own straw, that might be a little bit cheaper for, for certain producers. But, you know, we have to keep in mind what other options for forages might be out there. And so if, we, if we're able to go out and procure, you know, some reasonably priced, moderate quality grass hay, for $100 a ton, obviously, it probably doesn't make sense to, to go to the additional inputs, labor, investment, uh, and time uh, to treat, you know, wheat straw if we can purchase, you know, a comparable forage for maybe a similar price point. And so that's something also to be sensitive here, too. This is always an option that's out there, uh, but sometimes it makes more sense than others, just depending on what the supply and availability of some of those other forages are that are out there. Absolutely. And you mentioned the the labor associated with this, but there's also some management that comes with it as well. So what are some of the things that producers should know when it comes to storing and then utilizing this product? So, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have with treating straw with anhydrous ammonia is simply keeping the plastic on. And so I always advise producers that if they're going to do it, you know, do it early on in the year. Uh, You know, some other management considerations is we've We've treated this forage with anhydrous ammonia. So there is, you know, it does have that that ammonia permeates that stack. And so oftentimes, you know, uh, cattle will consume it and it certainly is palatable, but we need to let that that stack air for a few days associated with that. You know, there's also just that safety concern. We we hear a lot about anhydrous ammonia uh, safety and some of those things that are out there. So those are those are really the things that, that come to, you know, kind of the the forefront and top of mind of, you know, this, this is a, you know, there are some safety concerns with anhydrous ammonia. It's maybe an option that's out there, but I think in terms of preference, if we have access to some of those other forages, you know, those might be more palatable to those, those cattle as well, even though uh, this is certainly an option if a producer has that straw available or can't necessarily source some of those other forages that are available to them. But in terms of seasonality of when producers should probably be considering using this when is kind of the best time and considerations for that yeah so absolutely right now post weed harvest um, is really the best time to do this you know if we think about uh, the availability of straw being able to get that rolled up now obviously we know there was a lot of really short wheat fields across the state here so in some cases there may not be a lot of straw out there. You know, in other cases, in some systems, you know, we want to make sure we leave a certain amount of residue. But really right now, if a producer is going to to look at ammonia and wheat straw, this is the time to do that. That straw is available out on the marketplace. Um, we've got the temperatures that are in our favor in terms of getting that process done. I've actually had some stacks of, of treated wheat straw that the plastic blew off and was damaged within two to three days, and we actually still got a very good um, 
application rate and saw an improvement in the quality of that forage, even in just as little as two to three days when the temperatures were like they are going to be today in excess of 100 degrees and, and so forth. So now is the time to do it if you're, if you're going to uh, consider it. Definitely. And I don't know what it's like in the rest of the country, but here in Manhattan, we've got a week or so ahead of us that's going to be in those higher temperatures that would be best suitable for this. So Certainly. You mentioned quite a few different resources for producers to find more information. But if we could just sum those up here at the end, where can producers find more information on ammoniating wheat straw? Yeah, really the best resource is the ksubeef.org website. Uh, That's where we can find a few publications. You could also find this most recent article that we put together for our Beef Tips newsletter, as well as that YouTube video that walks producers through the process of treating forages with anhydrous ammonia. So it's really a how-to video of the process. Great. Well, once again, Justin, thank you so much for your time. All right. Thanks, Samantha. And of course, as always, any of the resources that Justin mentioned in today's show can be found in the show notes of today's episode, which will be located on agtoday.net. Once again, that was Justin Wagner. He is a beef cattle specialist here at K-State covering ammoniating wheat straw. Still ahead of us now on Agriculture Today, we have coming up Jeff Whitworth. He is a field crop entomologist here at K-State, and he's going to be talking to us today about soybean pests and quite a few of those that we should be on the lookout for coming up soon here in the growing season. Also ahead, we have this week's Milk Lines, which of course comes from our K-State dairy specialist, Mike Brook. So stay tuned for all of that. We will be back with that and more ahead on Agriculture Today. today. We are back now with Jeff Whitworth. He is a field crop entomologist here at K-State. And today we were going to be covering a few different soybean pests that producers should be on the lookout for in the coming weeks or so ahead, really, right? Yes, and good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. It's that time of year again where most of the crops are going strong, and so we need to be on the lookout for a lot of different pests. Soybeans is kind of a different case because we've had soybeans planted earlier during the conventional period of time, you know, late April, May. And after wheat harvest, we always have a whole bunch of soybeans that are put in the ground as a second crop in anticipation of their taking off and growing pretty well. That brings some problems with insects that you don't have with the other crops that are planted one time and go to harvest. The soybeans that were planted during the uh, first go around, I guess, those have been experiencing some bean leaf beetles. And a bean leaf beetle probably is the number one soybean pest throughout the whole soybean growing region of the United States. And every year, you know, it causes some problems within that region and within Kansas. The bean leaf beetle often is confused for southern corn rootworm beetles or other insects. And there's two different color phases of the bean leaf beetle. The adults are small. They can either be a reddish color or a tan color, but they're pretty easily identified by the spots on their back and the black or dark brown border around their back. They're pretty active, so when you go out into the field, they will often fly or drop to the ground or go on the underside of a leaf um, so that you don't notice how many are there. But they are the ones that early season, early on, after they leave the alfalfa, They move to the soybeans, and they start feeding on those seedling soybeans. They are the primary insect that cause the oval or the round holes in the leaves. There are lots of insects that will feed on soybeans, but the bean leaf beetle adult causes the round or the oval holes. That's pretty distinctive, really, when you start looking at it, instead of the jagged edges on the leaves like grasshoppers or some of the other insects do. That group of adults then will start laying eggs, which they are doing now and have been doing around the base of the soybean plants. Those eggs hatch and those larvae hatch out. They look, in my opinion, they look very much like corn rootworm larvae. If you put them together, and I don't have a microscope, I have a hard time distinguishing a corn rootworm larvae from a bean leaf beetle larvae. But bean leaf beetle larvae only feed on soybean roots or root hairs 
in a crop field. Corn rootworm larvae only feed on corn roots or root hairs in a crop field. So that's easily distinguished depending upon where you got the larvae. Right now we have beans that have just been planted and are just starting to, to germinate. If those larvae are there, if those adult bean leaf beetles are laying eggs on those new planted or newly germinating uh, soybeans, those larvae can feed on the root systems enough that they can actually stress the plant, especially where we don't have a lot of moisture. Irrigated fields is not a problem, but in the dryland fields, sometimes we'll see a spot in a field where you know the growers or the producers like to say, oh, there's a weak spot in that field. If you go out and look and pull up the plants, oftentimes you'll see these little white worms hanging on the roots. Uh, that's the bean leaf beetle larva. They will feed on those roots, and they will interrupt the translocation of nutrients and moisture and everything else. They can actually kill the plant, but they generally don't do it on a field-wide basis. Generally, it's a spot here or a spot there in a field, but that's something to consider. If you have a weak spot in a field or someplace where the plants look like they're under moisture stress, go out and look and see if it's a bean leaf beetle larva. So that brings a question to mind. When it comes to treating these guys, do you treat them on a per area basis? Or if you find them in that weak area, do you need to go ahead and treat the entire field? Probably neither. Uh, okay. that's, that's a good question. That's one of the questions we get a lot. Uh, generally, by the time you notice it, the larvae are about ready to pupate, and so they're not going to do any more damage. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, you get a rain or you know something will come along to help those plants get over that stress. It's just a, those, those larvae will be feeding probably for 10 to maybe 20 days out there on those, on the root hairs of the roots. So hopefully we'll get some moisture and the plants will recover. Soybeans are really good. They're really resilient at recovering from defoliation or if there's a little bit of root destruction going on. So really, I, we don't recommend treating any kind of a chemical foliar application at that time to control bean leaf beetle larvae. Now, some of the growers have used treated seed for soybeans. Again, in Kansas, we don't really recommend that. We don't really need it, but the, it works. If you know you have a problem in a certain area of your field, heavy residue, you got isopods or roly-polies, which is a real problem in south-central Kansas on early soybeans, or you got bean leaf beetles, or you have the potential of those those soybean treatments, and I'm talking about insecticides, that's, that's an option. If you're just getting ready to plant or you haven't planted yet, that's something to consider. But generally, we don't consider, you know, a rescue treatment for bean leaf beetle larvae. Now, bean leaf beetle adults, they're going to defoliate because as these larvae hatch out, the adults are going to fly around. They're going to feed on the foliage. Again, we don't worry about the defoliation so much until a little bit later. As those plants start to put on pods, start to set pods, and start to get into the reproductive phases, that's the time when bean leaf beetles can cause problems because the bean leaf beetle will feed on the pod. And the pod houses the bean, and the feeding on the pod can allow, you know, access from pathogens or other insects to the bean inside the pod. In another two to three weeks, when corn earworm larvae or soybean pod worms, whatever you want to call them, when they arrive in the state, they will start feeding on the pods, only they will feed on the seed inside the pod. You can have both corn earworm larvae and bean leaf beetle adults feeding on the reproductive part of the plant, and so they can cause a lot of damage very quickly in that regard. Why is that important? The bean leaf beetle adults will feed from now till harvest or till those pods dry down and, you know, turn brown. The corn earworm larvae is only going to feed for 10 days to two weeks. Then they're going to pupate in the soil. So when it comes to treating, it's all about timing. You want to make dang sure you know what's actually feeding on the reproductive part, in this case the pod or the seed, before you get out and treat or decide to treat or not. So when, time frame-wise, you mentioned that we're talking about this early, what usually, what time frame should they really be operating? The corn earworm, that's probably, in the state of Kansas, probably the insect that we most worry about as far as reducing yield year after year is the corn earworm or the soybean podworm. It's all the same species of insect. They overwinter in the southern part of the United States. They're here, but they prefer corn. So right now, as the corn around the state is in the whirl stage, a lot of it, they're feeding in the whirl or they're feeding in the ear. And once that 
is passed, then they will move to soybeans or sorghum or whatever's in the area. And that's the time when you need to start watching them. So if you have soybeans next to corn and the corn silks are starting to turn brown and the soybeans are starting to set pods, that's the time when you need to get out and start sampling or start monitoring for soybean podworm and the bean leaf beetle feeding on the pods or the reproductive parts of the soybean plants. There are some traps. You can you can get some pheromone traps and put them out around your field that help trap adult uh, corn earworm moths. So some guys put them around or ne- adjacent to soybean fields. When they start catching these moths, that's when they start going out and sampling their soybeans. But until they start catching the first adults, they don't worry about it. And that's a big time saver. Absolutely. Especially with the warm weather we've been having, no one wants to be working in those conditions looking for insects. That's exactly right. And there's other insects we need to worry about. The thistle caterpillar is one we've had oh, probably really more than I've seen it in the last three years. But so far this year... I've not gotten a lot of reports about it, but we're still early. We still have probably another oh, month to worry about thistle caterpillars. Again, those don't overwinter in Kansas, so it's just a matter of when they arrive here. And the uh, adult is the painted lady butterfly, and I have seen some of those. So it's a matter of how many over what period of time, whether they're going to uh, arrive in time to cause problems in soybeans or not. Insects are controlled 100% by the weather. If it's really dry, that impacts insects one way, or if it's wet, you know, it just depends on the species of insect, and we've had some strange weather lately, so I don't expect insect problems to go away, and we're just kind of getting on the start of maybe some, especially in soybeans, over the next six weeks, maybe, we need to be out monitoring our soybeans for various pests. Absolutely. Well, Jeff, as always, thank you so much. Hopefully this provides producers some insight as we go into this season, getting a little bit ahead of it so they're not overwhelmed once it does show up. But uh, as always, thank you so much. Yes. uh, One other thing they might want to watch out for are green stink bugs. The reason I say that is because we're finding adult green stink bugs right now. And right now, a lot of guys are out spraying their weeds as it kills the weeds. Stink bugs, they don't really care what they feed on as long as it's succulent. So as they spray the weeds, the weeds die down. A lot of those stink bugs can move to soybeans. Soybeans are really what we, what I generally worry about. I get calls every year about stink bugs feeding on corn, but we've not been able to show that to be a problem. But on soybeans, can reduce yield. Keep that in mind right now as you start your soybean monitoring program. Absolutely. Once again, that was Jeff Whitworth. He is our field crop entomologist here at K-State, warning producers about some upcoming soybean pests and ones to currently look out for. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. To wrap up today's Tuesday programming, we have, as always, our Milk Line segment for the week, coming from K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. This week, he shares with us what producers should know about the upcoming corn silage harvest. Today, I'd like to visit with our Kansas Dairy producers concerning the upcoming corn silage harvest. Crop is growing well, and in many parts of the state, we're actually past tasseling already. So, when will we be actually chopping this crop for silage? Kind of the old rule of thumb was 35 to 40 days after silking. However, that has kind of changed a little bit. And some of the things we need to think about as we consider when to actually chop the corn for silage would be whole plant moisture as well as kernel development. It's been a lot of emphasis in recent years on looking at just whole plant moisture. And that is important and a reason that we need to get out and and chop silage many times, particularly if we're in drought conditions. However, If we have good plant moisture, we need to be watching the milk line as well. You see, the corn silage will gain about 25% of the total starch in the last couple of weeks of kernel development. So as we progress from one-half milk line or one-half of the kernel developed to three-quarters of the kernel depth developed, usually takes somewhere around 10 to 14 days, depending on weather conditions. But as we increase that last part of the kernel development, we actually increase the total starch by a significant amount. So why is that important? 
Well, think about what you're paying for corn right now. Some of you are probably paying $7 a bushel or more for corn. So every little bit of starch that we gain from the corn in the corn silage means we have to purchase less corn to feed our dairy cows. This would also go for beef producers as well. So if you're listening in, this is something you maybe want to take into consideration. So ideally, when do we want to chop the corn for silage? Well, we'd like to see the milk line at least three-quarters of the way down the kernel. And we would still like to have adequate moisture. So about 35% dry matter up to maybe as high as 38% dry matter. We really don't want to go much above 38% dry matter because we start to have more issues with packing, not getting the right density if we're talking about drive over piles or bunker silos. Secondly, we will not get the correct fermentation if the corn gets too dry. Now here's the tricky part. If we have very hot weather, obviously the corn is gonna mature very quickly. And with the weather we've been having recently, that could be the case. So you may not have a lot of days to think about this. Basically, maybe only about a week between kind of ideal conditions and less than ideal conditions. Because sometimes the field will lose moisture at a rate of about 1% for each day. So we quickly progress from 35% dry matter to 40% dry matter under those types of conditions. Hot southern winds can also increase that even at a greater rate. So as you consider when you need to chop, you need to think about milk line as well as whole plant moisture. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to consider both starch content as well as whole plant moisture when pulling the trigger on chopping corn silage. That concludes this week's Milk Line segment and today's programming. But before we leave you, just a preview of what's to come tomorrow on Agriculture Today, we will have with us the Kansas Farm Service Agency's State Executive Director, Dennis McKinney, providing the latest update on FSA programs, including upcoming acreage reporting deadlines, ongoing CRP program processing, and upcoming nominations for county committees. Also on tomorrow's program, we will have with us Susan Metzger. She is the newly named director of KCARE, as well as the associate director for agriculture and extension here at K-State. She will be chatting with us about her new roles, as well as water conservation for this week's water conservation segment. Tomorrow's program will end with this week's Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts segment, where your beef cattle questions will be answered by various K-State professionals. For Agriculture Today, I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network.